Okay, so just before we start off, I have a, uh, a public service announcement about the Cedar and Jasmine help desks. Um, so bear with me ever so briefly while um, we just let you know that we, we've literally just sent out um, a message to all our users to say that um, we now have a new email address for our Jasmine help desk. So essentially we're splitting the Cedar and the Jasmine help desks. So from now on, please use support at jasmine.ac.uk if you want to submit a uh, help desk query to us. Um, and that's as opposed to those specifically CEDAR related where you'd use cedar.ac.uk. Um, it's also worth noting that on Jasmine related websites, there's now a, a help beacon button, this orange button, and you can click on this and you can use it to search our help documents to submit help desk queries directly um, and when you submit a query you can use various drop downs to specify the type of issue that you're having um, what we hope is that that, that will speed up um, our response times because it will make it easier for us to select the right person to get onto those queries and, and get back to you so please just make a, a note of that that we now have a Jasmine help desk that's separate from the Cedar help desk. Okay. Right. So, um, we are talking about our new Jupyter notebook service, and the first place I'd recommend that you might need to go is um, to the help.jasmine.ac.uk site. So this is our our help pages, and if you typed in notebook you can find that there's a page that tells you about the Jasmine Notebook service. Um, it gives you a little introduction about what a Jupyter Notebook is, which I will go through in a minute. Um, and it gives you instructions for how you can sign up for access to the Notebook service um, using the Jasmine Accounts Portal. And so if you want to use the Jupyter Notebook, sorry, the Jasmine Notebook service, um, please be aware that you have to sign up for it and then you'll be able to get access. Once you do that, so once you've got full access, um, let me just pull this down for a minute. You will come to um, a site that looks like this. Um, so this is notebooks.jasmine.ac.uk and this is my own user space and I'm just going to make this full screen um, so we can use this from now on. Um, so one of the first things to note is that when you first enter your notebook service, um, you will see this from time to time. There are many services all running in parallel for each individual user. And if you've been idle for a while, um, the service will shut down in order to conserve and share resource. So I can click restart at any point click my server and that will restart for me and bring me back in there. So I'll, I'll come back to this window and then I'll work from there. So we've put together a set of um, <clears throat> introductory notebooks um, and there is the one at the bottom here is notebook tour and that is all seven sections um, brought together in a single notebook but then I've got um, seven separate notebooks to talk through the different parts so if I double click one of these this will take me in. Now one of the things you might notice over here is that you have a file system the file system here that you can um, navigate through this is your Jasmine home directories. This is exactly the same Jasmine home user space that you would get to if you logged in via a normal SSH terminal. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the Jasmine notebook service. We're going to talk about what, what notebooks are, um, talk about how you can run Python in the browser, show some examples of plotting, um, and then we're going to talk about some aspects of the service that are um, particularly useful for Jasmine users. Um, so one of them is that you have access to the Cedar archive um, 
in the same way that you would for from an SSH session. So you can read files directly from the CEDAR archive. Um, you can also read directly from group workspaces. Um, so those are the two of the key selling points for using this particular notebook service. Um, we'll also talk about adding additional software um, if you should need it um, using virtual environments. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about another aspect of why notebooks are so useful, that it's really easy to share them. Um, it's really easy to, to use them as um, ways to describe your science and share your science with the wider world. So what is a Jupyter Notebook? Well, we're looking at a Jupyter Notebook at the moment. Um, this particular example is just documentation. So this is all written in a format called Markdown. And if I click in one of these cells, you can see how it looks in its raw format. Um, if I execute that cell, we get it nicely rendered again. So a notebook's an interactive environment that runs inside a web browser. And I'm just gonna confirm again that I'm just inside a web page essentially here. So all of this is running inside a web page uh, at notebooks.jasmine.ac.uk. Um, and a notebook allows you to define, edit and run code. Um, in our case, this is Python code. Um, so we've enabled our notebook service to, to run Python 3. Um, you can embed visualizations within your code. Um, you can include any kind of documentation and annotation um, within your workflow and your notebook. And, and as I said earlier, they're really useful to share with other people, to share with um, collaborators, and to sometimes use as a way of demonstrating how your code can be accessed and, and how it can be worked with. So we're going to demonstrate some of the behavior here. Um, please be aware that there's also a help tab. And up here we can see a help tab. And that takes you through to various references. If you want to read more about um, Jupiter, who were the people that put together the whole um, note, notebook technologies, there are references for Python and IPython and various things. Um, so you can look at that. Also, if you want to go at any point to our um, documentation that I showed you at the start, here's the link to the Jasmine docs. Um, and there's a few specific links to Jupyter Lab directly and trying out a Jupyter Lab notebook. So one of the key questions is, why would you use a Jasmine notebook service rather than any other? So there are many free notebook services on the web. Um, lots of institutions have their own notebook services. And so the, the key reasons I think why this is useful is that if you have a Jasmine login account already, then you have access to your home directory. So you have ha access to all the same files, what, whatever content you might have on there. Um, so you can potentially share, you, you can use the notebook as another view of working on Jasmine. Um, another really useful aspect is that you can see the CEDAR archives, you can see slash BADC and slash NEODC. And so any data sets that you have access for in an SSH session, you will have the same access to. You can read from group workspaces, so any group workspaces, the projects that you're working on on Jasmine, you'll be able to read the files in the same way with the same account permissions. And we've also set up our notebook service to have the same common software that's available on our scientific analysis servers and on our batch cluster Lotus. So this is stuff that we call Jaspi, and there's a help page there that tells you more about that. So it's Python 3.7, but it also includes NumPy, NetCDF4, um, Iris, and a whole a heap of other packages as well. Um, and also there's a way in which you can install other packages, software packages into your notebook um, to extend it if you need to. Um, and the last link here is just saying that where I am now, I'm working from this URL. Okay, so let's actually look at what this means. So at the top of all these um, notebook 
tour um, notebooks, sorry, um, I've got the overview of today's session. So we've been through one and we're coming on to using Python in the browser here. Okay, so what does this mean? So at any point, if I click on one of these cells, you'll see that it gets highlighted with this big blue bar on the left. So if I click this cell um, and, and I press shift and enter, because it's just a documentation cell, nothing happens. I've now highlighted a code cell. And if you see up here, it says code. Um, if I click on this one above, it says markdown, which means the format, which is the, um, the, the, the text format, format that's used to render this. But if I click on a cell that says code, then it's gonna be Python executable code. So a really important thing to learn from the start is that you can write Python just as you could in a Python interpreter, but when you want to execute a particular block of code or a particular cell, there are three ways you can do it. You can press shift and enter, which executes the cell and moves to the next one. You can press control and enter, which executes the cell but, cell but stays focused on the current cell, or you can press alt and enter, which executes the cell and creates a new one. So normally, I'm just going to be pressing shift and enter because I already have all these cells created. So if I press shift and enter here, it executes the shell. It, it gives me a response. So I asked it to print hello and it's done that. And then because I press shift and enter, it moves me on to the next cell. So the next cell is now in focus. So a bit like the Python interpreter, even though we use print up here, we actually, if we just want it to um, display the value of a given variable or a given string, we can just um, give, give the name or value of that in the cell and it will echo it back to us. Okay, so we can do a basic Python things, but actually we can include any Python that we want. So we can be importing external code, we can write um, functions, we can write classes, um, so we can use Python as we would in real life. So for example, here I've defined a constant and I've defined a, a very simple function that converts a temperature in Celsius to Kelvin. And so if I press enter there, it hasn't actually echoed anything back because all I've done is I've defined a constant and I've defined a function. Now having defined it, we can call it in our notebook. So here we're going to convert um, the temperature of zero Celsius and we're going to test that value. So if I run the code there. Sorry, I think I need, need to put print here. There we go. So so here we've just got an if clause, we're testing the value, and if it was bad, it tells us the function is bad, but it actually works and it returns and tells us that. Okay, so now we can, let's see if we can run a function for a cell that hasn't um, been run yet. So down here we've defined say hello as a function. So here we're gonna try and run say hello Apologies, occasionally it will um, ask me to restart the server. And when it does that, I will just have to quickly go through this process and get back to where I was. So I was just showing you that say hello has not been defined. And when I try and run it, it says, it says that it hasn't been defined yet. But if we then define the function say hello. Then we can now run it. You haven't got a kernel loaded. Hag. I haven't got a kernel. Thank you, Matt. Just try and work. Okay, so. Top right, in the top right. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yes. Kernel. Okay. So this is this is a useful thing. So if you get your, if the, if the kernel stops and it says that it, it needs to restart, um, it will give you this message in the top right corner saying no kernel and so if you're not getting a response as I wasn't there if you click on that you can select python 3 plus jaspi which is the standard python 3 and it will come in and do that 
So now if I go in again, I try say hello, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because hello, say hello is not defined. If I go down one, I've now defined it. And I run say hello and it runs the function hello and returns to me. So a really important point about this is that each time you run a notebook, it will execute all the cells in order that you want them to run, but you have to do it in a logical order. So if I, if I come in and I want to run some code that requires certain Python libraries to be imported, I need to make sure that I've executed those cells before I try and do it. So you just be aware of that, that if you're reusing notebooks or trying to use part of a notebook, it may be that some of the cells are dependent on things you've done earlier. Okay, so let's make it a bit more exciting. We can import math, so we can import um, modules from the Python standard library. We can import other packages that we've installed as part of the Jaspi um, software suite of tools. So Pandas is a, a great Python library for manipulating um, tabular data. We can import pandas, we can create a thing called a data frame, and then we can display the content. One of the really nice things about um, an IPython notebook is that, or Jupyter notebook, is that it understands a lot of common Python tools and Python structures. So it knows about pandas and it knows that pandas draws tables. So this data frame is this thing here. Pandas thinks of it as a table, and if you ask it to display, um, the notebook is clever enough to render it in a nice HTML table to make it nice and clean to look at. So we've shown that you can run Python, but another thing to be aware of is that you can also run shell commands. So if you begin a cell with an exclamation mark, you can then call out to the shell, um, which remember the shell is running essentially in your Jasmine home directory and in this particular case it's calling out and saying the present working directory is the location of these notebooks but this part of it this is my Jasmine home directory and these are subdirectories within it and again if we use exclamation mark at the start we can do something like a, a long listing here so ls minus l okay so we've shown there that within a notebook we can run interactive code. Um, so we can run Python code, we can call out to the shell. The third thing I want to show is how you can do simple plotting. Um, and so typically we use a tool like matplotlib. Um, I'm just gonna go in and clear all the outputs for a minute. So notice what I did there, edit, clear all outputs. And that takes my notebook back to its raw um, raw state where none of the outputs that have been created are actually visible. So this is just a simple two-liner. So matplotlib, many of you will be aware of, um, is a very common tool in Python for all kinds of nice um, graphs, charts, um, and, and maps. And so we can import it. We import this object pyplot um, as just plt. And we can do all sorts of complex plotting, and we'll come, we'll come and look at some of that in a minute. But just to demonstrate, if we just send it a simple linear range of numbers from 0 to 9, it will just plot the simplest um, graph that it can plot to demonstrate that. So another really nice thing about notebooks is we can annotate things so we can put nice, nice, clear titles, different sections, bullet lists, etc., explaining what we're trying to do. We can have the actual code itself, and then we can actually display the outputs. So things like pandas data frames or, or plots that we generate. And actually beyond this introduction, there are even interactive things that you can do with notebooks. So you can have um, widgets where you can zoom in and out of more complex visualizations. Um, we don't have any material for that yet, but um, that's something that, that's a bit more advanced that you might want to look into. Okay, so what's next? So point number four, 
working with data in the CEDAR archive. So most of you who are already Jasmine users um, will be aware that um, we have a, a number of petabytes of data on disk from um, different research projects um, from around the world and a lot of UK data from NERC projects, um, from Met Office models, et cetera, um, and MCO satellite data. Um, and so we have all of these things under these two main directories, slash BADC and slash NEODC. And you, if you're using our notebook service, you can access these in exactly the same way as you would if you were logged into an SSH session um, on Jasmine. So it's important to also say that if you want to know more about the data sets underneath these directories, um, they are all catalogued and described in the CEDAR catalog, which you'd find at this URL. Um, so you can find all the sort of metadata and information about those projects, about who, who generated the, the data, what instruments, what models were used, etc. And then eventually they would point you back to um, various parts of the file system. So one project, um, an enormous project, is the sixth a coupled model into comparison project or CMIP6. And CMIP6 is um, providing a number of petabytes of data um, in NetCDF files. Um, and these are simulations from mo climate models from around the world and um, performing numerous experiments. Um, so here we have a bit of example code using a software library called X-Array. Um, so X-Array provides a nice, um, a, a higher level um, wrapper around the NetCDF4 library um, that Python uses to talk to NetCDF files. And it, it, it gives you a, a more um, intuitive way of interacting with those files and the data in them. So here we, we import X-Array. We define the path to one of the files. Um, and then we open the data set into X-Array. So DS here is data set. Um, we now have this data set, so we can have a look at it. And X-Array tells us um, about the contents of it. So it tells us about the coordinates, tells us about the variables and attributes. So it looks very much like a, the in, internals of an NetCDF file. So TAS here is surface temperature. That's our variable of interest. So here we're going to take a, a, a single layer from that variable. So you, you'll see at the top that, that it has um, 600 time steps and latitudes and longitudes. So we're just going to take a single time step from this data. And once we've sliced out this time step, all it has is its latitude and longitude array. So now we can import matplotlib as we did last time. And if we import matplotlib, we can now plot that layer from X array. So in here, we did some time selection and we squeezed out the time dimension. And then down here, we're saying that we would like to plot this. Sometimes it doesn't plot and it requires me to do it a second time. I'm not sure about that, but um, so, so here we get a, a global view of the data. Um, and then we decide we want to focus in on um, the African continent. I'll just restart that again. Um, so for the those of you that spotted it last time, when it, when it asked me to restart the server, I need to go up here where it says no kernel and just select the kernel and it will let me start again. I need to, um, I'll double check whether I need to, yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it's cached where it got to previously. So it knows about my session. So we'll plot this one again. And then in this last example, we are using the, the CarterPy library um, created by the Met Office that does all sorts of nice um, projections and cartographic plotting of maps. And so we're adding in here the borders and the coastlines 
and we're just asking that to plot again. Here you can see that there was an asterisk there, and whilst Python's thinking about what's happening, um, there's an asterisk inside the cell next to a, a the, the code that's being executed. And once it's finished, you just see the number of that cell again. Okay, so what we've demonstrated here is using data from the Cedar archive and then using common Python tools to access the, the and process the data in a way that you want to do it. So we can read from the Cedar archive. Another thing we want to be able to do is read from group workspaces. So those of you that aren't familiar with Jasmine, group workspaces are large allocations of disk um, that are um, specifically given to a certain project or collaboration. So a group of scientists will be working on a group on a group workspace. In this example, we're using the Cedar proc group workspace. So that's the standard path, absolute path on Jasmine to an internal Cedar group workspace. And I've just got a text file with some UK maximum temperature data in it. So here I'm using the pandas library. So this is another um, very popular, um, very common tool, um, as I mentioned earlier on, for working with tabular data. And pandas has a read CD CSV function and that function um, allows you to read in any kind of um, text comma separated or tab separated data so in this case it's space separated so we're going to read in that data from the group workspace and let's just have a look at the first few rows of it so we can call df.head and that will show us the, the first three lines and so we've got um, January to December. Um, then we've got the, the seasons and annual temperature. And it starts in 1910. I think it goes all the way up to, to the year 2000. So I've decided that I'm really interested in subselecting the columns January and July. So we can do this with this nice little operation on this pandas data frame. So the data frame is a pandas representation of this table and you can do all kinds of filtering and processing um, and selecting with it. So the first thing we do is we select JJ or Jan, Jan and July and we can have a look at the header from that. So we can see from that that they're, um, we've just selected these two subfields. Um, we might even we might even be interested to find out the length of it so i might decide well i'm gonna i'm gonna press alt and enter and that's going to run that cell but it's also going to create a new cell and i'm just going to say well how long is that so there are 105 rows in this particular table okay and then finally i want to plot this um, so this will behind the scenes use matplotlib again um, and I'm setting the title and the Y label of my plot. And I think again if I need I might need to run that twice just to, to tell it to make sure it picks it up. Okay and so here we have the the July and the um, sorry the, the January data down here and the July data for maximum temperature records. So that was an example again of using um, libraries that we've installed as part of this JASPY um, suite of tools. We're reading from a group workspace that I have access to on Jasmine and we are able to, we're able to show um, particular objects that the notebook is aware of such as data frames and we're able to generate and and show plots as well so we're almost there two more parts of the tour to go now this next one for most people might be might be too advanced in that you might not need this at all but um we, we wanted to make sure people knew about it so that they have um somewhere to go when this problem happens um so a common thing that that you might find is that you want to use Python 3 
um, and you want to use the Jasmine Notebook server, but there might be a particular library or a set of particular libraries that are not installed as part of the Jaspi environment. Um, and so you need a way to install your own um, extra software dynamically. Um, so this is actually possible using Jazz, Py, um, Python's virtual environments. Um, and many of you will be used to the idea of creating virtual environments at the command line and using a tool called pip to install them. Um, you can actually do this all inside a notebook. So um, here's a sort of basic walkthrough of how you can go about doing it. Um, I suggest that for most people, you wouldn't want to remember the details, just know that we've got an example um, notebook that talks you through this. So there are three key steps. The first one is to create a virtual environment. You only need to do this once. Um, secondly, you need to activate the virtual environment. Um, and so that means your Python session knows about it and it, it goes and looks there for code and it can also install code into it. And then the last part is installing any extra packages you need. Um, in this case, we are suggesting that you, you create an NBVMs directory in your home directory and that that's where you store any notebook virtual environments that you create. Um, one of the key things is that these virtual environments will not work um, if you're logged in via SSH on Jasmine because there's just a slightly different version of Python on the two systems so they, they won't actually um, you, you have to create them separately if you're using them in virtual on in notebooks. So if we look at step one, step one essentially imports the required packages. It defines this top level directory in your home directory, NBVMs, and it checks if that exists and it makes it if it doesn't exist. It then does it then creates a specific notebook environment that you're going to use for the notebook you're working on. Um, so that's just creating the path for it. And then the next thing that happens is it checks whether that directory exists for that notebook environment. If it doesn't exist, then it will call this command virtualenv.create environment and it will create a new directory with a whole um, sort of core of a Python environment inside it. In my case, it's already created, so it didn't do anything there. So step two, we need to activate this environment so Python knows that it can talk to it directly within this Python session. So if I run that, that just runs, and this, this incantation here, um, you can just use, you don't need to understand what it's doing particularly, but you can just use that, and now you've got your Python environment activated. So in this case, I want to install a new package and I want to install a package called fixnc. So fixnc is a, a very lightweight package in the PyPy repository. So you can, you can install it with pip and it's a way of talking through Python to a netcdf file and fixing the metadata in it. So first of all, let's prove that um, we don't have fixnc installed. So this bit of Python says, try to import fixnc and if it doesn't work then say that it, we failed to import it okay so we, we failed to import it and so now i'm going to say i want to pip install it and this line will pip install and even though we've got a warning here this is just a warning it's not an error and eventually it says installing collected packages fixnc so this has gone away, found the package fixnc, and it's put it inside this environment that we created up here. I'm just going to have to um, have to restart my kernel again. And then right at the end, now we've installed fixnc, we can, we can import it and we can print where the file is to prove that we've installed it. 
So again, this isn't something that most of you will need to do most of the time, but it's important to know that we have a recipe for allowing you to install your install other packages um, into a notebook so that you can use them for a given notebook. So the last thing to say is that notebooks are superb tools and many of you use them already I know for for sharing your science for sharing your code and examples of what you do um, and so it's a great idea to put them into a version control system so that they're safe they're backed up and they're versioned and it's great to share them with colleagues and collaborators and we really recommend using github to do this um, and so there's a bit of talk here for how we can set up a GitHub repository and I'm going to show a very quick example of this. So if, you, if you're interested in understanding more about Git and GitHub, please have a look at one of our other webinars which we've linked to here. Um, but in terms of how to get started, you have to set up a GitHub account if you don't have one. So that's github.com. Um, and then if I wanted to create my own repository, I, I can go to um, go to this URL. Actually, I'll just I'll create it here. So if I go to my GitHub account, I can go to repositories, and I can create a completely new repository. I'm going to call it my notebooks. It's going to have my notebooks in it. I'm going to make it public because I want to share it with people. Um, I'll add a very basic license. So I can create this repository. And then back in my notebook, I can actually call out to Git at the command line. Do you remember we said in our second part of the tour that we can run shell commands if we put a, an exclamation mark at the start? So I can give it the URL to my notebook. And if I include my username in that, then when I try and push content back um, to GitHub, it will, it will be able to work with this. So I will try and execute this. And so it's saying it's going to clone into a directory called my notebooks. And there you go, we've, we've unpacked objects into this directory. Okay, so at this point in GitHub, I have, I've created this thing called my notebooks. Um, and in our, um, in our server here, I've checked this out. So if I go back to my home directory over here, so I can navigate through the directory structure on the left, because I'm basically looking at my Jasmine file system. If I scroll down, we should have a thing called my notebooks. Okay. Now my notebooks has got nothing in it at the moment, but I could say, um, okay, I want to create a new notebook. And so this has nothing in. I'm going to say um, Eureka, I've done something great. And um, there you go. There's my bit of code I want to share with the world. So I now have a notebook. I'm going to rename this. And I'm going to save it. And I'm now in a position that I think I will go into quickly in a in a Jasmine terminal window. I'm going to go into my notebooks and, and I'm going to um, add that notebook, add my Eureka notebook. I'm going to Commit it with a message. Um, added notebook. I'm going to push it, and it will ask me for um, 
ask me for my password. Okay, so I've now gone to the point where I've created this repository to put notebooks in. If I reload this, we can see that my IPython notebook now exists here. And so I've created a repository, I've cloned it to Jasmine, I've inserted a notebook into it. Um, so I could copy other notebooks in there, or I can add them as I like. Um, and then I've now got a GitHub repository, which is publicly available so the rest of the world can see it. And other people can all have a look at my notebook and see, see about the incredible thing I'm trying to share with them. So another great reason why you might use GitHub to share your notebooks is that GitHub can even render your notebooks um, inside its interface. So it shows them in notebook format. You can't actually run them here, but you can bind them to um, interactive tools that allow you to run them interactively in other places as well. But that's a story for another day. I think I've said enough. Um, I hope that was useful and we're very happy to, to take your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Ag. Um, right, let me go through these questions because we've got quite a lot on the chat. So um, first question is from Angelina, which sa who says, uh, can we write to group workspaces from the notebook? That is a fantastic question. Um, uh, we, we had a, a lot of issues about security in getting the notebook service set up. And one of the decisions that we came to was in order to, to get a version of it out the door that people could start working with, um, that was one of the constraints that we were limited by. So in the current version, you cannot write to group workspace. You can only write to your home directory, but you can read from the archive and the group workspaces. Um, Matt, do you want to make a comment on how likely it is in future for us to get right access to the group workspace? Uh, I think it probably will happen at some point, but the other the other side of it being a conscious decision to only allow read access was because we don't we actually don't want to encourage the use of the notebook service for data producing at the moment. We only want we want to encourage the use of the notebook service for visualizing existing data. So you should you should still be using Lotus for your data production or for any hardcore processing. The notebook service is for is providing an aid for visualization. So that's another reason why it's read only for group workspaces. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Um, so a couple of people have asked whether the notebooks can be used with R. Um, I had a quick chat with Matt about this, so I do have an answer myself, which I can read out. So at the moment it is um, just Python and wider Jupyter notebooks do support R, but uh, as part of the Jasmine notebook service, we don't currently support it. Um, and Matt, you said that this might change in the future if we can see that there's demand for it. But as the majority of our users use Python and that's where our experience in the team is based, we have only got Python on there at the moment. Does that uh, summarise? Do you have anything else, Ag? Um, just to say, um, we've had chats with various parts of the community before um, about better support for R and maybe better document documentation for R. I think we would, we would need a real steer from the community or, or a, a ground, groundswell of support and help from the community so that we felt like we had the ability to support users with R. So feel free to contact us offline and to make a push for that. And maybe we could pull enough people together to make that happen. Thanks, Eric. Um, okay, so someone else has said, does this mean we can submit Lotus jobs from these notebooks with the exclamation mark syntax? Um, Matt, I'm assuming that the um, LSF and Slurm interfaces are not installed. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So, no, you can't do that. Okay. Someone else has also said, are there plans to integrate Lotus? So, with the notebooks? Mm, no, but there are plans to look at integration of a tool called Dask which is 
primarily for executing Python code in parallel across a cluster. So um, we will probably be looking at that at some point in the next few months. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But not Lotus, probably. Okay. Uh, someone else has said, how are you dealing with the resources behind? Is it everything running on the login node or on a dedicated queue? Um, yeah, so actually it's quite interesting for those who are of a technical mindset. It's all running in Kubernetes, so it's all containerized. So the notebooks, the notebook servers run in Docker containers on a, an orchestration platform called Kubernetes. So this is totally separate to the login nodes, totally separate to Lotus. Um, it's currently got a few, so the, the, the worker nodes in our Kubernetes cluster that supports this are on bare metal. So there's no virtualization in the way. So hopefully the performance should be reasonable, but um, yeah, that's how it's running as containers in Kubernetes. Great, thanks Matt. Um, okay, so someone else has asked, can we, can we import already written code from our local PC? And if yes, how? Um, and so I suppose there, there's two ways of thinking about that. You can certainly copy and paste code, Python code, um, from somewhere else into a notebook, um, but, but probably, you're probably asking, can you import libraries that you've written? Um, so you, you certainly can. So the typical way that you might do that is if you've got some code that does a useful thing. Um, so you might have a module called module and you might have a, a function called plot inside it. Um, you could transfer your module um, or your package over to, ja to Jasmine. Um, you could put it in your home directory and then you can in your notebook you can modify your um, sys.path variable to make sure that it's looking in that directory to find its modules and then you can just do import module directly and it would find it. Okay thanks Ag. Um, someone's just asking for confirmation. So can you just create a virtual environment in the size server user space and just activate it in the notebook? Or do you need to build it always from the notebook server? A very good question. So there, there's a subtly different version of Python running on the size servers and the Lotus nodes compared to um, the version running in the notebook service. Um, and that subtlety is enough so that if you create a virtual environment on one of them and try and use it in the other, it will not work. Or, or when we've tested it, it hasn't worked. So we promote this idea that um, you might have virtual environments under a VM's directory on Jasmine and then have a separate set under an NB-VM's directory um, for use with notebooks. Um, so just it, try and keep them separate and then you won't have that problem. Okay, thanks, Zach. Uh, someone else has asked whether you can use GitLab. You, you, so you certainly can use GitLab. Um, Git, GitLab is um, a very similar tool to GitHub. Um, and I, I suppose GitHub just has more integrations with more things and more features. Um, but both of them provide access to um, free repositories, private and public repositories. Um, and depending on where you are, you might have a local GitLab server in your institution um, as well. So in general, the answer is yes. Um, there might be some nuances depending on how you, where you're using GitLab. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um Someone has asked whether Conda environments on Jasmine can be activated from within the notebook server. Um, so I think the answer is no. And I say I think because that's only based on the testing that we've done. But the, the overall Jaspi environment that we're providing is all provided through Conda. Um, and typically you can't create a Conda environment within a Conda environment. Um, so that's why we promote this idea of using virtual env and pip because 
that essentially sandboxes that environment away from the base conda environment. Um, I, I'm happy for people to experiment with it and see if there is a way, but we don't think you can. Okay, thanks, Zach. And the final uh, question I've got at the moment, unless anyone keeps typing something whilst I'm talking, is saying, I just patched my Python path to add my own packages in my home directory to my notebooks. Uh, is this a reasonable way to add them? It seems lighter weight than virtual environment. I replied to this one, but I forgot to say reply to everyone. So <laughs> it will work for pure Python packages only. Anything that links a C library dynamically will not work because the libraries will be at a different location. So. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Matt, um, just, just to double check, I understand that. If you're, um, if we're talking about patching the Python path, are we talking yeah. about doing that in the bash RC file or something like that? Um, uh, I think this, I think this user was talking about the first line of their notebook being right, a yeah. sys.path.append. Yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so we've got another question just come in, which says, in the talk, we saw the server restart with an error three to four times. Would that get worse with load? Yeah, that's something I've never seen before when I've been using it. So I don't know is the answer, but I would encourage people to report it when it happens so that we can look at it. It's, yeah. It might be that everyone listening is trying to click on it. Yes. Um, Matt, actually... might there be something about the fact that I would have a kernel running for each of those notebooks? Potentially, yes. I mean, maybe, yeah. I couldn't see anything really in the logs for your notebook. But, right. Yeah. So, so there's nothing automatically timing out? Um, yeah, it wasn't obvious that there was anything going on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, it is worth noting that the notebooks are designed to die after a certain amount of inactivity. So, and that's quite a short number so that we ensure good usage of the service. So if you're, if you know, like, I think most of the, I think the restarts happened after you not pressed play on a cell for a while, mostly. So that might also have something to do with it, but we can definitely look at upping that duration if it becomes a problem for people. Okay, um, I'm going to take this as the final question because I'm aware we've got two minutes left and people might have other meetings to go to. So the final question is, how do you plan to monitor use and scale the notebook resources as people take it up? Um, yeah, so we, we have monitoring in place for this. Um, scaling up the resources is as easy as adding new nodes to our Kubernetes cluster. So um, we're nowhere near stressing the current cluster at the moment. So that's why I don't think the issues we were seeing would anything to do with load. So. Okay. And, and right. Matt, for those people that are very techy and, and would like to see diagrams and understand more, do you, do you have any paper or anything describing how, how the um, architecture works? I don't, but it's very similar to the Pangeo architecture. So yeah, if people okay. know what Pangeo is, you can look up that. 